Welcome back to the Nikki Clark Show. The show is about transforming lives one story at a time. And I'm always thrilled to invite people from all walks of life to come and share their heart stories, their stories of transformation, upliftment, and empowerment. And really excited to have a chat with former Mr. Ontario uh, bodybuilding champion, and he's also uh, a regular guest and co-host on, on multiple radio and TV platforms and also a writer at Faith and Fitness Magazine. Please welcome Sean Maves to the show. How are you doing today, Sean? Very good. Thanks for having me on the show, Nikki. Oh, it's, it's a pleasure. Thank you for your time. And I just wanted to, you know, say that, uh, you know, so much has been happening in the world uh, and it's always such um it's such a a pleasure to have you know conversations with people like you who are really trying to be a beacon of hope and i know that you have an incredible story so let's get to it tell us a little bit about your background leading to what you're doing right now yeah no thanks for asking me uh, that question nikki uh, i'm a former bodybuilder as you mentioned earlier In the intro, a former Ontario champion, Mr. Ontario heavyweight champion back in 1989. I was a competitive bodybuilder in the late 80s, early 90s. And uh, now I share my story on uh, uh, Facebook and uh, YouTube and uh, U.S. and Canadian uh, radio stations uh, and some TV stations also. I try to encourage people Mm -hmm. to stay healthy, but I also uh, talk about uh, some of the the pitfalls and... um, in, in the sport of bodybuilding, when we go too far mm-hmm. with, uh, you know, this, I, this I, idea that we see in magazines, both female and, and male, not only bodybuilding, but we see that, that, that this, uh, these images, we see the, the thin uh, media-based, thin body ideal for the, for the females in the cosmetic ads and, and um, TV shows, radio, stuff like that. So that, that's kind of my, my uh, platform right now is to speak about, on those issues, faith and fitness, uh, uh, subjects right um, excellent and can you tell us a little bit about you know what your story is um, as you were uh, you know getting motivated to becoming uh, this you know world-renowned uh, bodybuilder uh, what got you there and and what were some of the trials and kind of the triumphs along that journey yeah no thanks for asking me the question first of all I'll say that I was not world-renowned. I was I was known locally and, and maybe a little bit more now, actually, now that I'm doing some media stuff. But, uh, you know, a lot of guys get into bodybuilding just like I did because of the interest, what we see in the magazines back in the late 80s and 90s. Um, you know, bodybuilding was was well-promoted in, in, on, um, on magazines. Now today it's Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter, YouTube. We see um, uh-huh. the, the, the sport being popularized on those platforms. A lot of guys are getting interested, just like I was back in my late uh, teens, early 20s, impressionable years. So I was in the gym six times, six days a week uh, on a high-protein diet and, and you know, training maximum intensity. I was doing all the things that I thought it would take to win. And I achieved uh, some success, moderate success. Some guys will tell you otherwise who have gone further than me, but I, I achieved enough success to really understand what it takes to win in that sport and uh, what the cost is. And this is one of the things I've been very vocal on U.S. Canadian TV, radio stations, YouTube, some of the, um, some of the darkness in the sport of bodybuilding, not only, not, in, not only the sport of bodybuilding, but pro sports to get to reach the top. There was actually a survey done in the mid eighties. It was called, it's called the Goldman survey. And um, this gentleman, he asked a, a number of world-class athletes, what they would take, what would they do to win a championship? And if they were given a drug, and this drug would would um, give them um, the the advantage to win, to be at the top of their sport, but there'd be a price, and that price would be it would it would kill them within five years. Over fifty percent said they would do it. And so this is kind of the mindset of uh, an athlete who wants to go to the top in bodybuilding and some other sports. People are willing to pay, pay the price. So, you know, this is something that. So what was I've, the uh, price? Well, the price would be their life. The price would be their life. Mm-hmm. The drug would would kill them. And so, what mm-hmm. I try to mm-hmm. what I try to tell people is, uh, is you know, the, the the right now, for for example, the sport that I was involved in, bodybuilding. There's over 
two to four million uh, users of anabolic steroids in the United States yeah. alone. Not all competitive bodybuilders, but just some guys who want to look good on the beach. In high school, we see a growing problem. Three to seven percent high school students have admitted to using anabolic steroids. And uh, one of the top uh, guys in, in pro bodybuilding today has admitted on a reputable website that he uses $20,000 U.S. on a 16-week cycle of steroids to get ready for competitions. Mm-hmm. Now, this is a, on the extreme end. So, wow. And there's a growing list of side effects that athletes who take these drugs to reach the top of bodybuilding and other sports. Um, for example, a lot of guys, we're, we're seeing a growing list of of pro bodybuilders and wrestlers who have died prematurely in their 50s. Guys are coming mm-hmm. down with um, heart disease, uh, kidney, liver damage. Um, one, of the, um, one, of the, one of the drugs that the guys are using today is growth hormone. And that, that accelerates the growth of not only healthy tissues, but also cancer, cancerous tissues. So if I'm talking to a male and you have the possibility of microscopic prostate cancer cells, uh, the, the GH will actually accelerate those. those. So I, I try to, I try to warn people. It's like, um, is it worth the risk? Is it worth worth the risk to be an Instagram star, in bodybuilding, or perhaps get your name if you're lucky enough to be in the top, but uh, have all these health consequences? So this is one of my platforms. I speak about the dangers of the sport. I also talk about faith issues. On occasion, on a call-in show, we talked about this off air at the Cross Live is the show. And I co-host that show on occasion. It's a we used to be on Canada's Yes TV. Now we're on uh, Roku TV live stream and YouTube, and we talk about uh, uh, the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So this is something I'm also very passionate about: is talking about the gospel. Okay. Um, so let's talk about your story, Sean. So uh, you you're at this point now where you're a champion to help you know people to overcome or to just you know, stay away from the dangers, the pitfalls of using, um, you know, uh, enhancing drugs uh, for their image, for their, you know, career in in bodybuilding or other type of professional sports. What was your personal testimony? Um, Did you ever fall to the pressure of taking the drugs? And how did it affect you personally and professionally? Yeah, no, that's that's a great question. Now, I'm very open about this now. I wasn't at the time. For three years, I trained natural. From 18 to 21, I went by the book. I trained six times a week, clean, healthy diet, six, six meals a day, high-protein diet. And then, you know, I, I was tempted because I, I felt that I would not be able to achieve my goals without taking steroids. So for two and a half years off and on, I was a moderate user. I was a user, but not as uh, was, I wasn't using as much, certainly as much as some of the guys are using today. But it was still harmful to my body. And I was, uh, uh, Nikki, you know, I was living a lie. There was three uh, na- newspapers who were, were interested in my story after I became a tarot champ. And uh, the fir- mm-hmm. one of the first questions they, they always seem to ask you is, have, have you used steroids? And I, I lied. I was lying yeah. to my to newspapers, family, friends. You know, I was just kind of living a lie. And as I, as mm-hmm. I expressed in my testimony a couple of times in different shows, I was a Christian, born again Christian, totally living right. outside of God's will, uh, just concentrating on ambition. And, um, you know, the, the, everything kind of reached a, a climax back in 1990. And just everything mm-hmm. started to fall apart. I remember how, uh, visiting the hospital. One of the drugs I was using put me in the hospital. I was living an empty life, broken relationships, outside of God's will, just so empty. And then, but you know what? It's, it's God's kindness that leads to repentance. I remember a friend calls me up. Uh-huh. A friend calls me up and invites me back to church. And you come back to church, uh-huh. and God started to breathe life back into me, Nikki. And that's where my that's where my uh-huh. story started to turn around. I was I wasn't perfect uh-huh. day one, but God started to breathe life back into me. And the best right. I always tell people, you know, the best one of the best things I did back then was throw the steroids I had in my gym bag in the garbage, and I never looked back. Right. That was your kind of road to Damascus moment where you met the Lord and you said, I've had enough. You yeah, know, it really is, was. This uh, is my yeah. bottom. I, I need to change my life around and let God lead me. And uh, that's yeah. amazing. So that was from what year and what happened uh, that after 19, that 90, when you made when that I decision? Made that, yeah, when I made that decision in 1990, I didn't stop weight training. I still weight train to this day two or three times a week in moderation. Well, you know, I, but, mm-hmm. but God just kind of opened my eyes. I wasn't, I was by no means 
uh, perfect back then. I, I still am. There was many flaws, and many people listening to the show know me. It was like, I remember where you were back in the 1990s. You did this, that, and the other thing. Well, but God yeah. was on the road to perfecting me because there's no perfection. Uh-huh. We, we can try to perfect, you know, the physical body, but it's the, it, but God looks in the heart, and He started to do work uh-huh. inside of me. So that was only yeah. that was only step one of getting rid of the steroids and the the bodybuilding competitions. Yeah. God had a lot more work to do, and He's still doing work on me today. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and that's one of the topics I really enjoy talking about is is uh, you know when you enter into this world of bodybuilding or health and fitness and you make this your main focus you can enter into a cycle of perfectionism doesn't matter who you are it doesn't you know you don't have to be a competitive bodybuilder maybe it's just somebody who's really image conscious and there's a lot of males and females alike and um you know it can become slowly it can become an idol because anything you put before god is an idol in my view and um mm-hmm. you know it's a tough master you know when you try to serve um you know this false god of, of image you know and that's yeah. you know it's very uh it's very prevalent in the, in the sport of bodybuilding and health and fitness some people just kind of take yeah. it too far you can go too far to left or right some people mm-hmm. in north america be tempted to do nothing live out this sedentary lifestyle become a um you know a, a spectator instead of participant and eating mm-hmm. you know the average north american diet high calories and and, and eventually they get type 2 diabetes if they're you know, eating too much sugar. That's one end of the spectrum. And the other one is just totally uh, think everything is about how I look. And I'm going to spend every, you know, every minute I can on my appearance. And that's too far to the left to the right either. So you know, this is something yeah. to kind of talk about in different platforms and, um, and um, try to engage people on those subjects. Yes. So uh, the um, steroids becomes the idol and, uh, people fall to the pressure and, the, and the, they become slaves to this idol. And um, your estimation, Sean, how many professional athletes would you say still dabble in it? Although it's illegal, how much would you guesstimate are still doing it? Yeah, that's a good question. I was on um, another show, Yes TV show, a couple of years ago. I gave it some, some stats, did some research. Uh, Brady Quinn, former Brown's quarterback, NFL quarterback. He was on a CBS podcast, and he gave out these numbers. He believes that 40 to 50 percent of NFL players are, us- are using uh, HGH, which is human growth hormone. It's 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 a, it's a dangerous drug to use. And uh, there was another uh, gentleman, George Carl. He coached 2,000 games. Former NBA coach. He wrote a book, and he 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 says that the NBA has a drug problem. He's not talking about recre- so-called recreational drugs. So he believes that performance enhancing drugs are also surprisingly prevalent in the NBA. That's not me saying that. That's George Carl. So if anybody wants to question mm. those, those two names. So I don't, like to, I don't like to guess myself. I know what, what I see and mm-hmm. I suspect. But, so there's you know, two relatively good sources of information for, for that. And of course, everybody knows that Pro bodybuilding, the, the, the drug problem is just off the charts. I mean, it's it's just uh-huh. undeniable. I mean, it's no question. There was uh, years ago, uh, you know, bodybuilding was once way back was once a, a very modest display of strength, health, and fitness. You got to go back to the 40s and 50s, back in back to the Steve Reeve days. He was the right. former Hollywood star who starred in the movie um, Hercules. So you got you got to go back uh-huh. to that time frame before you can really say that the sport of bodybuilding represented strength, health, and fitness. It's completely something different today. Mm-hmm. That's, that's, that's really good. I'm, I thank you for, you know, mentioning those resources. So, yes, it's up to the listeners to kind of check that out and, and go back and, and see um, what the numbers are saying. But, they, you know, the proof is in the pudding, uh, and it's actually really alarming uh, to know that all these, you know, athletes uh, that people kind of revere – are really going through their own kind of battles so that they have their own inner demons that they're dealing with uh, as it's related to the pressure of, of taking these performance enhancing drugs uh, in order to, you know, be the best at what they do. So it's, it's really, um, 
quite amazing what, what you're sharing. So thank you for that. So how has your life been transformed? You know, you've gone from where you were, where you started out as someone who's interested in bodybuilding and then you got to uh, a high level of achievement in bodybuilding and now you're, you're sharing this incredible testimony and, and helping people, giving them great advice. How has that changed your life? Yeah, it's really, uh, that really changes us from the inside out. I, like I said before, I, I, I still like weight training. I just love getting in the gym and, and exercising, you know, a few times a week, no question. But now I see my, myself as, um, as being a communicator of the gospel, first of all, and secondly, to engage people on these subjects that we talk about. Uh, one thing I like to talk about with people is, uh, first of all, the longings. The longings that we have to be the top of our sport or to, to you know, to win, or, or to gain wealth and fame and all these things, they'll never really satisfy us. Uh, I'll give you a couple of quotes. Ronnie Coleman was eight-time Mr. Olympia champion. That's a top, uh, you know, top bodybuilder in the world. Eight times he was a top guy. He, one time he was interviewed by the Australian Ironman magazine. And they, asked, and they asked him a question. He said he was never totally satisfied with the way he looked. Can you imagine that? Top guy in the world says he's not satisfied. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, J. Wow. Paul Getty was once the, the world's wealthiest individual back in the 1960s. And they once asked him mm. a question. He said, what would make you happy? And J. Paul Getty said this, one more dollar, one more dollar. You can never really satisfy these longings to be uh, for fame and money. It just doesn't work. So today, to answer the question, um, you know, Jesus, Jesus always points us to the truth. You know, he told us in the Bible, the greatest among you is your servant. You know, real... And I just love what you're doing, uh, Nikki, with the show. You know, bringing out these testimonies and all these stories and with your music. And that's what real life begins is when we start to serve others, when we start to serve God, country, and others first. That's when we really get Mm -hmm. satisfied and fulfilled, I think. And so this is, you know, kind of my goals now. I do it imperfectly, uh, you know, through media on occasion and on Facebook, engage people, and even people on the street or, you know, meet them at the coffee shop and it's all about, you know, pointing people to the light, a better way of living. And, and Jesus mm-hmm. said, I am, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the father except through me. He is the light. He's a tr- true mm-hmm. source of, of, of truth and, and um, you know, fulfillment in life. Amen. Amen to that. Absolutely. Sean, it's just, uh, it's been a, such a, an, an incredible you know, opportunity to listen to you and to learn from you. And I know the viewers may have, or sorry, the listeners may also have some uh, questions for you or they may want to reach out to you about um, more about your story. So how can they connect with you on social media? Okay. Thanks for, thanks for giving me the opportunity. You can Google my name, Sean Mays, S-H-A-W-N-M-A-V-E-S. And you'll see my YouTube channel, my Facebook uh, you can engage with me there. On occasion, I co-host uh, At The Cross Live, the TV show I mentioned earlier, at thecrosslive.com. And, uh, it's a great television program on uh, satellite TV. And, uh, you know, just, just Google my name. Everything comes up. And the, the people, people find me that way, I guess. That's the best, uh, best way of contacting me. Okay. So it's Sean and Maves is uh, spelled M-A-V-E-S. So that's where you mm-hmm. can be located right on youtube and very very good very good to be on the show today okay oh well thank you it's been really it's been an awesome opportunity and i'm really i'm really hoping that uh, it'll connect people in the way that it should and and heal people where they need to be healed and um, i'm grateful for your courage to share your personal story so thank you so much yeah absolutely thank you so much uh, yes you Oh, it's, again, really, uh, really a pleasure. So you've been listening to the Nikki Clark Show and uh, very special guest, Sean Maves, uh, former uh, bodybuilding champion and uh, now uh, using his personal testimony uh, and um, expertise in uh, fitness uh, through faith to help uh, serve his community. So again, Sean, have uh, a wonderful day. Stay safe and look forward to connecting with you at another time. Okay, thanks a lot. Take care, Nikki. Okay, bye for now.